This video is about Black History. Not Black History Month, but Black History. Because Black History Month repeatedly fails to inform us of the history of the Hebrews, which are the black people of the book. We've been taught by a curriculum that was designed by the government and placed in the public schools to keep us limited in our knowledge and information as it relates to the history of black people. Scripture is clear where the black people of America descended from. We are the people of the book. And this video is intended to show you how and why we arrived at the place that we are in the United States of America. Actually, America, what I call the great kidnapper. They kidnapped the people of the Most High, but the people of the Most High has been under his judgment because of our rebellion to his laws and commandments. But in these days, he has awakened us. Can these dry bones live? Yes, they can, because he has risen the dry bones out of the valley of death. So this video is about black history and um, it's more information that you can use to teach the younger generation to open up the eyes of the people of the Most High. To all my brothers and sisters, Shalom, wa wa Akwa, always to the esteem of the Most High, Elohim, Yah. Testing, testing, one, two, three, four. <clears throat> I almost hate Black History Month nowadays, but I try to use the opportunity to educate those who think they know black history especially our, our white counterparts to black history, unless that white person carries a strain of melanin in their blood. How is it when February rolls around, black history is worth them trying to tell the story? I don't care if you talk about the involvement of black regiments during the Civil War, black troops of World War I and II, black involvement during Vietnam, and even Desert Storm. If it was not for the white establishment and white ruling class of the stolen land of America, there would be no need for black troops. Also, every single black man and woman who fought in any war of this country did not fight, and I repeat, did not fight for their freedom. They, we fought for the liberty of the Constitution of the United States, of which not one Negro or slave is mentioned in that constitution. You out this world Need some space for me I'm out here, girl I'm back up in the street So I don't really got time To fuss and fight no more with you. Really got the very constitution was written and signed during the time of heightened slavery in this country. Hell, black men had to fight to be able to fight in the Civil War. President Lincoln was against blacks bearing arms and President Lincoln wanted to send blacks back to Africa. The 16th POTUS views were widely known at the time and publicly spoken by him once declaring they are kind of an alien group who have been uprooted from their own society and unjustly brought across the ocean send them back to africa that's what america's 16th president publicly said about blacks in this country read the book by eric fauna the fiery trial When this president signed the Emancipation Proclamation into law, his personal views of blacks in America were no longer made public. Afterwards, he was seen as the great 
deliverer of blacks and hailed as the president who freed the black slaves of America. When you look at some of these images, it appears Abraham Lincoln was worshipped by the misled slaves of America. American history wants you to believe Abraham Lincoln was the foremost deliverer of our people. Lincoln, like all presidents of the United States, no more desired the freedom of black people than Satan himself. He, like every president, was used to the fulfilling of the will of the Most High. Let's look a little bit closer at the so-called African-American history that we are just now finding out about. We all know about the Declaration of Independence, the signing of the Constitution of the United States of America, Paul Revere and the British are coming, the Louisiana Purchase, the Battle of New Orleans, the Battle of Gettysburg, the Battle of Little Bighorn, the stock market crash, the atomic bomb from America that laid waste Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the assassination of Dr. King, Malcolm X, and JFK, the Watergate scandal, the Monica Lewinsky affair, September the 11th, 2000, otherwise known as 9-11, the election of the first black president, the election of Donald Trump. But have you heard of these events? John Henry Turpin. Ever hear that name before? If black history is supposed to be American history, why did the following so-called American history never make it in the history books? Chief Turpin was one of the first black American promoted to chief petty officer in the late 19th century. Not only did he secure the rank of E7, he survived a naval explosion not once, but twice, rescuing shipmates. In the second explosion, the record reflects that Turbin rescued 13 men by swimming them to the shore one by one. The United States aircraft carrier Bennington blasted and flame seared limps into Quonset Point, Rhode Island after the second greatest peacetime sea disaster in naval history. The dock is a temporary receiving station for the 91 dead and 201 injured. A sudden unexplained explosion turned Big Ben, as she is known in the Navy, into an inferno 70 miles offshore, trapping hundreds of men below decks. This is the melancholy procession of the dead. Many of them burned beyond recognition. Many of the victims were at breakfast in the officer's wardroom when the blast and sheet of flame caught them unawares. The tragedy wrote a saga of heroism for men who plunged again and again into the sea of flames to rescue injured shipmates. Their tale is one of tragedy and courage, with their ordeal etched on smoke-blackened faces. 91 are known dead, but of the 201 injured, 92 are so critically burned that the death toll is expected to run higher. As the flames raced through the cavernous decks, many dropped in their tracks, enveloped in a shroud of fire. As they reached Quonset Point, civilian ambulances and medical help rushed to reinforce Navy personnel, and hundreds of blood donors from miles around volunteer as news of the tragedy spreads. An heroic and exhausted crew for whom Captain Rayborn expresses his pride to Secretary of the Navy, Charles Thomas. Secretary Thomas has ordered an immediate investigation by a Naval Board of Inquiry into the second disaster suffered by the Bennington in a little more than a year. A toll of death for Big Ben. Eleven men received the Medal of Honor, but Turpin did not receive a medal. But this is American history, right? This image is from the Naval History and Heritage Command. This is a copy of an official photograph of the United States Navy, and the only caption they recorded in history was, this sailor is almost certainly 
John Henry Dick Turpin, who had also survived the explosion of USS Maine in February 1898. And that's all they had to say about Chief Turpin. Almost certainly, John Henry Dick Turpin, the U.S. Navy knows for certain who the man in the picture is. But to keep American history one-sided and void of black presence and heroic accomplishments, that's all the Navy recorded in history of the heroic acts of Chief Petty Officer Turpin. One of my favorite fearless and heroic black men was the acts of Robert Smalls. In the midst of the Civil War, he took a Confederate ship and did this. Robert Smalls was a 23-year-old slave pressed into service for the Confederacy aboard a warship called the Planter. For nearly a year, he quietly observed the movements of the ship and its crew. Just before dawn on May 13, 1862, Smalls took his chance. While the ship's officers slept ashore, he and his fellow slave crewmen pulled anchor and eased the Planter into Charleston Harbor. They had prearranged to meet their family members and to pick them up and then come back down the peninsula and they begin the process, and this is in the wee hours of the morning, of sailing out of the harbor. They are embarked now on an extremely dangerous journey. Smalls knew these waters like the back of his hand, but he also knew the risk that lay ahead. Four Confederate checkpoints, Castle Pinckney, Fort Ripley, Fort Johnson, and Fort Sumter. Isn't Smalls afraid of being caught? How in the world is a black slave going to pull this off? He's extremely afraid of, of being caught. He disguises himself as the captain and also mimics the captain's gait as he walked back and forth across the wheelhouse. Small slipped past the first three checkpoints undetected. The most dangerous checkpoint remained, Fort Sumter, with its mighty guns and fearsome cannons. Discovery would mean certain death. As dawn broke, the crew urged Smalls to take a wide berth, but changing course could arouse suspicion. Smalls gave the signal. A few seconds later, the counter signal came back. Pass on by. So they're safe, right? They're free? Well, they're not completely free because now we have the situation where a Confederate flagged vessel is sailing out and it begins to approach the vessels of the Union Naval Blockading Force. Fortunately, the vessel was not fired on. As astonished Union officers boarded the planter, Small stood at attention, saluted, and spoke. I am delivering this war material, including these cannons, and I think Uncle Abraham Lincoln can put them to good use.
Private Henry Johnson. Yep, Private Henry Johnson, a badass brother from North Carolina. Mm-hmm. But you never heard of him, have you? Neither have I, until I went into the armed forces myself and started learning some things. The narrative reads like this. While on night sentry duty, May the 15th, 1918, Johnson and a fellow soldier, Private Needham Roberts, received a surprise attack by a German raiding party consisting of at least 12 soldiers. While under intense enemy fire and despite receiving significant wounds, Johnson mounted a brave retaliation resulting in several enemy casualties. When his fellow soldiers was badly wounded, Johnson prevented him from being taken prisoner by German forces. Johnson exposed himself to grave danger by advancing from his position to engage an enemy soldier in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Wielding only a knife and being seriously wounded, Johnson continued fighting, took his bolo knife, and stabbed it through an enemy soldier's head. Displaying great courage, Johnson held back the enemy force until they retreated. The enemy raid's failure to secure prisoners was due to the bravery and resistance of Johnson and his fellow comrade. The effect of their fierce fighting resulted in the increased vigilance and confidence of the 369th Infantry Regiment. As usual, in typical American mode of operation, it only took 67 years for his act of bravery to warrant him a Purple Heart, posthumously, and 73 years to be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross in 2002. Johnson died July the 1st, 1929, in Washington, D.C. It took 67 and 73 years to recognize that brother. Now, that's American history, typically suppressing black history that competes with and in many cases outshines the white American history story. Those descendants of the Hebrew slaves accomplished a great deal of divinely inspired and undoubtedly supernatural things. Private Johnson, it's a bad mother. If you would like to see more videos like this, please contact me at www.hadarsyakov.com or Hadar Yaakov YouTube or Hadar Shmaryahu Yaakov Facebook or www.amazon.com backslash Hadar S. Yaakov. And feel free, you can always email me at Hadar S. Yaakov at gmail.com. Tell me what you think of this video. Give me your comment and your opinion. Share the video, share with others, so that we all may come to the knowledge of the truth that will make us free, to the esteem of the Most High, Elohim, Yah. This is part two of a month-long series. The series is ongoing for a lifetime, but 
Most black people recognize and celebrate the short month of February as Black History Month. Actually, black history transcends as far back as antiquity, during the age when blacks ruled the world. But for the sake of my Black History Month lovers, I always offer my two cents worth. Prayerfully, we will change the paradigm of black history and amalgamate February with the other 11 months of the Gregorian calendar as black history. In part one, I began with the exploits of Abraham Lincoln. Part two will begin with the exploits of George Washington, the first president of the United States. In many ways, George Washington's acts impel the mindset and acts of Abraham Lincoln. Washington was arguably the worst president in his treatment of the Hebrew slaves. Washington, like Lincoln and all 46 POTUS, have always been used as oppressors to the children of Israel. They have been in the hand of the Most High, like Nebuchadnezzar was called my servant. Nebuchadnezzar was the servant of the Most High, fulfilling the will of the Most High. In other words, his purpose must be fulfilled at the hands of the oppressor. So while black history is appalling, degrading, dehumanized, and evil, the acts of men fulfilled the purpose of the Most High. George Washington considered one of the so-called founding fathers of America, enslaved black men and women for 56 years. Mr. Washington owned 317 slave people at his dwelling place of Mount Vernon. One particular slave of Mr. Washington got my attention, Hercules Hosey, a cook. But I will let a professional historian tell the story of Hercules Posey. Hercules was a member of the Mount Vernon enslaved community widely admired for his culinary skills. Washington appreciated Hercules' skills in the kitchen so much that he brought him to Philadelphia during the presidency. Hercules arrived at Mount Vernon as a teenager in 1767 when George Washington purchased him from a neighbor. The young man soon became one of the estate's cooks. By 1777, Hercules had married Alice, a seamstress and a dower slave. In September 1787, Hercules was issued three bottles of rum with which to bury his wife. They may have been shared at her funeral. Alice's death left Hercules with three young children, Richmond, Eve, and Delia. Upon moving to Philadelphia, President Washington hired a cook but was unhappy with him, so he requested Hercules be brought to the presidential mansion to cook for the Washington family, friends, members of Congress, and foreign dignitaries. Hercules insisted his son Richmond join him to serve as scullion or kitchen assistant. As a perk of his position, Hercules was permitted to sell kitchen leftovers such as bones, feather, ash, and fat, and keep the earnings. With them he brought fashionable attire ordinarily unavailable to the enslaved. Years later, Washington's step-grandson recalled the cook's daily evening promenade through the streets of Philadelphia wearing his finest clothing and greeting friends with formal and respectful bows. On February 22, 1797, 
Washington's 65th birthday, Hercules ran away alone from Mount Vernon. Washington made several unsuccessful efforts to locate his former cook, but he was never found. Washington believed Hercules escaped to Philadelphia. He may have used connections in the city's Quaker or free black communities to hide. After their father's escape, Richmond, Eve, and Delia remained enslaved at Mount Vernon. A visitor of the estate in March of 1797 recalled asking one of Hercules' daughters if she was saddened by her father's disappearance. Oh, sir, she replied, I am very glad because he is free now. Benjamin Banneker, a pillar in the shape of Washington, D.C. Like all cornerstones of the design and advances of this nation, Banneker, another unsung black history person. But I will let a professional historian tell the story. Benjamin Banneker can best be described as a mold breaker. He was born in 1731 in Ellicott's Mills, Maryland. As a child, he attended a Quaker school, one of the few institutes that offered integrated education, and he put what he learned into practice. At just 15, he developed an irrigation system for his family farm. When he was 21, a friend gave him a pocket watch, which he promptly took apart to figure out how it worked. But he was not simply satisfied by understanding the mechanism. He needed to make his own. So Banneker built his own clock from scratch. And it was so well engineered and the mechanism so precise that it struck on the hour, every hour, for the next 40 years. Banneker's clock gained him a reputation, catching the eye of a famous clockmaker, Joseph Ellicott. He helped Ellicott build a complicated clock and in return, Ellicott loaned him scientific books and instruments for astronomical study. He taught himself everything there was to know about science and math, particularly astronomy. He began using what he learned to predict weather patterns and plan agricultural methods. He even predicted a solar eclipse in 1789, successfully contradicting many notable minds of the time. Seeing the practical applications of his work, Banneker began publishing Benjamin Banneker's Almanac in 1792, and it was a wild success. It contained information on weather patterns, farming practices, and was basically a how-to guide for agricultural life. The Almanac also included political writings, such as a plan of a peace office for the United States, which caught the attention of Thomas Jefferson, and the two exchanged several letters. Banneker even implored Jefferson about the evils of slavery, advocating for abolition. When it came time for President Washington to appoint a commission to survey the site of the new capital, Washington, D.C., Jefferson made sure Banneker's name was on the short list. Banneker worked closely with French architect Pierre L'Enfant to plan the capital. But L'Enfant was notoriously difficult to work with and was known for his explosive temper. As a result, L'Enfant was dismissed from his post before planning could be completed. And in what could have been a devastating move, L'Enfant took a year's worth of the plans with him. Just when it seemed that the team would have to start from scratch, Banneker saved the day and the capital. In two days, Banneker recreated L'Enfant's designs entirely from memory. He redrew every street and stream and building, effectively saving the capital as we know it. Banneker died in 1806 at the ripe old age of 75. So next time you're in Washington, D.C., the next time your dad refers you to the Farmer's Almanac for all the information you could ever need, remember that we owe that and so much more to Benjamin Banneker, the first African-American scientist. Last but not least, is an, an animated character, especially loved by Americans in the 1920s, is none other than Betty Boop. What makes Betty Boop significant is the real live person of Esther Jones. The University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff tells the story of Esther Jones. Although many believe Helen Kane is the inspiration for the animated Betty Boop, the character would not have been possible without 1920s jazz singer Esther Jones, aka Baby Esther. Nicknamed after her baby singing style, Esther Jones performed regularly at the famous Cotton Club in Harlem. She was known for using phrases like, 
Boop Oop a Doop, and other childlike scats in her music. After seeing a baby Esther, Helen Kane adopted her style and began using boops in her songs as well. When Betty Boop was introduced, Kane promptly sued Fleischer and Paramount Publix Corporation, stating they were using her image and style. After the trial had gone on for two years, Max Fleischer managed to locate a 1928 sound film of Baby Esther's performance, boop doops and all. The case was finally put to rest. Baby Esther's legacy was restored and Helen Kane's theft was exposed. The original Betty Boop dancing with Popeye the Sailor Man. Look carefully as the original Betty Boop comes on the stage. You may ask, what does Betty Boop have to do with black history? It shows how the oppressor of the Hebrew slaves sought to discredit all creativity and talented facts of black people in this country. Not that the oppressors were genuinely inventors, warriors, astronomers, sailors, merchants, and on and on without the significant aid and assistance of black people. Hence, Black History Year instead of Black History Month. As you can see, even in animated characters, the oppressor sought to discredit the black man and woman. If you would like to see more videos like this, please contact me at www.hadarsyakov.com or Hadar Yaakov YouTube or Hadar Shmar Yahoo Yaakov Facebook or www.amazon.com backslash Hadar S. Yaakov. And feel free, you can always email me at Hadar S. Yaakov at gmail.com. This is part three of a month long series. The series is ongoing for a lifetime, but most black people recognize and celebrate the short month of February as Black History Month. Actually, black history transcends as far back as antiquity, during the age when blacks ruled the world. But for the sake of my Black History Month lovers, I always offer my two cents worth. Prayerfully, we will change the paradigm of black history and amalgamate February with the other 11 months of the Gregorian calendar as black history. In part one, I began with the exploits of Abraham Lincoln. Part two will begin with the exploits of George Washington the first president of the United States. Part three 
is the eye opener exploits of the 28th president of the United States in the person of Woodrow Wilson, a true racist at heart, hiding behind the lies and deception of politics. Woodrow Wilson was an extremely racist. Segregation in the history of America, as implemented by the 28th President of the United States, the exploits of President Woodrow Wilson, like all presidents, have been overlooked, hidden, dismissed, or simply trivialized as insignificant. American history as some like to emphasize, is black history, rewritten, covered up, or viewed as perpetuating negativism and division, when in fact black history is way too important and contributory to the history of America and needs to be viewed as the underlying fabric of America. Get rid of Black History Month. In an 1881 article that went unpublished, Wilson defended the South's suppression of black voters, saying that they were being denied the vote not because their skin was dark, but because their minds were dark. Yes, really. When Woodrow Wilson assumed the presidency in 1913, many Negroes believed that he would champion their cause for advancement. An unprecedented number of Negroes had cast their vote for Wilson, risking ostracism or ridicule from others of their race for so departing from the ranks of the Republican Party. This deviation from the traditional line of Negro support was nurtured by discontent with the Republican and progressive candidates, Taft and Roosevelt and their platforms. It was spurred by the stirring assurances of wholehearted support to the Negro race by Woodrow Wilson. Yet it was in Woodrow Wilson's administration that the most bitter blow to Negro hopes of advancement fell. The introduction of segregation into several of the federal departments This action raised questions of vital concern to government race relations and created a sensation among nearly all elements of the colored world as well as among some of the white. The subject of Negro-white relationships in government was raised in a cabinet meeting April 11, 1913, soon after the new administration had come into power. Upon taking office, Wilson himself fired 15 out of 17 black supervisors in the federal service and replaced them with white people. After the Treasury and Post Office began segregating, many black workers were let go. The head of the Internal Revenue Division in Georgia fired all his black employees, saying there are no government positions for Negroes in the South, a Negro's place in the cornfield. To enable hiring discrimination going forward, in 1914, the federal government began requiring photographs on job applications. Historian Wesley Moody describes Wilson's most famous book as an academic, a history of the American people as steeped in lost cause mythology. The book was generally sympathetic to the Ku Klux Klan, describing them as men half outlawed, denied the suffrage without hope of justice in the courts, who meant to take this means to make their will felt. This means 
being violence and intimidation against black people. There was a film made in 1944 about President Woodrow Wilson. Like always, as told by white historians, these men and women are always presented in light of honor and integrity. The so-called founding fathers are memorialized as successful builders of the United States of America. They are glorified, angelic in some ways, and worshipped by the historians that present them. However, there is a clip in the movie where the character playing Wilson's wife reads the plaque of Abraham Lincoln signing the Emancipation Proclamation. The character playing Wilson appears to be unhappy about what Abraham Lincoln did. He is motionless and gives no response. Yeah, Tommy, she didn't sleep here. Can't you almost feel them? Heavens, you don't think the house is haunted, do you? <laughs> I don't know, but a lot of them were extremely reluctant to leave here during their lifetimes. Hello, Jane. In this room, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863, whereby four million slaves were given their freedom and slavery forever prohibited in the United States. Imagine it in my room. I'm not sure if the producer of that movie intended that scene to be so obvious. But it was, and I applaud the producer for that one scene because it reflects the evils and diabolical, wicked schemes of the 28th president of the United States. Woodrow Wilson hated black progress and black achievements. This is American history, but separate from black history. Woodrow Wilson and the 1915 movie, The Birth of a Nation. History is usually written by the winners, but that wasn't the case when The Birth of a Nation was released on February 8, 1915. In just over three hours, D.W. Griffith's controversial epic film about the Civil War and Reconstruction depicted the Ku Klux Klan as valiant saviors of a post-war South ravaged by northern carpetbaggers and immoral freed black people. The film was an instant blockbuster and with innovative cinematography and a Confederate skewed point of view, The Birth of a Nation also helped rekindle the KKK. Until the movie's debut, the Ku Klux Klan, founded in 1865 by Confederate veterans in Pulaski, Tennessee, was a regional organization in the South that was all but obliterated due to government suppression. But the birth of a nation's racial charged Jim Crow narrative, coupled with America's heightened anti-immigrant climate, led the Klan to align itself with the movie's success and use it as a recruiting tool. Adopted from the book The Klansman by Thomas Dixon Jr., who was a classmate and friend of President Woodrow Wilson, The Birth of a Nation portrayed Reconstruction as catastrophic. It showed radical Republicans encouraging equality for black people, who in the film are represented as uncouth, intellectually inferior and predators of white women. And this racist narrative was widely accepted as historical fact. Academic histories mostly centered around the Dunning School, McKeown says of his historiographical school of thought conceived by scholar William Archibald Dunning. 
it concluded that reconstruction was a terrible mistake, which helped validate the film's message, McEwen added. Shortly after the Los Angeles launch, Thomas Dixon Jr. convinced President Wilson to screen the movie inside the White House, arguably the first time that was ever done. President Wilson reportedly said of the film, it is like writing history with lightning. And my only regret is that it is also terribly true. Although the quote's authenticity has been disputed, there is no debate where Wilson stood on the issue of race. He resegregated the civil service, says McHugh. It's not unreasonable to conclude that he thought the film was amazing. And of course, a movie screened at the White House was going to be perceived as an endorsement of the film. One white supremacist in Georgia understood this implicitly. This article was taken from History.com. How Woodrow Wilson tried to reverse black American progress. This video is not monetized, rather created for educational purposes. The article was written by Becky Little. Black history like you have never heard before. William Monroe Trotter, a nemesis to Woodrow Wilson. William Monroe Trotter was a trailblazer. He was a civil rights leader. He was an unapologetic race man and he was the most famous of Monticello's descendant community. I am Gail Jessup White, Public Relations and Community Engagement Officer at Monticello, and also a member of the descendant community. I'm related to two families that were enslaved at Monticello, the Hubbard family and the Hemings family. Down with the realities of black life were in the early 20th century. Whereas both Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois really focused on the Black elite, Trotter really considered himself more of a champion for the people, someone who is a facilitator or an amplifier. It's these grassroots activists, poor and working class, largely migrant communities in the Black North that Trotter is really hoping to galvanize through the Guardian newspaper by allowing the people to speak. Woodrow Wilson successfully won the White House in part because of the support of African-American men. Women, of course, at that point couldn't vote. William Monroe Trotter supported Woodrow Wilson through The Guardian. And Woodrow Wilson made promises to address issues that concerned the Black community. But once he got in the White House, he re totally reversed his position. And one of Woodrow Wilson's first acts as president was to segregate the federal government. Now, after the Civil War, a lot of freed men and women moved to Washington, D.C. And a lot of them got what we in Washington, I'm a Washingtonian, what we people from Washington call a good government job. And these jobs gave a lot of black people entree to the middle class. But when Woodrow Wilson came in the White House and segregated the federal service, he eliminated a lot of those well-paying jobs. He didn't want black people to be supervisors or managers over white people. So some black men lost their jobs or were demoted to lower positions with lower salaries. They lost their livelihoods. That's what Woodrow Wilson did. He ruined people's lives. Monroe Trotter started a petition and got some 20,000 plus people across the country to sign this petition to ask Wilson to reconsider his position. Trotter and a delegation had a meeting with Wilson at the White House. And Wilson said that he would, in fact, reassess his position. And of course, he did not. So Trotter and his colleagues went back to the White House for a second meeting. And this time, Trotter was much more confrontational. And when Trotter confronted Wilson man to man, citizen to citizen, Wilson told William Monroe Trotter that he was offended by his tone and put him up. They had the delegation escorted out of the White House. 
He's in Wilson's face because he's heard the promises and then seen the reality. And Monroe Trotter tells Wilson, we are not here as wards. We are not here as dependents. We are here as full-fledged American citizens and then demanded the desegregation of the government. And then Wilson goes into this argument that, well, segregation is a benefit to blacks, not an injury to blacks. And Trotter comes back at him and says, have you a new freedom for white Americans and a new slavery for American fellow citizens who are black? And Trotter's on the national stage really for the first time, and he's being scorned by white supremacists as insolent to the president, and then hailed by progressives, black and white, for a courageous stance, standing up to Wilson. And I think for Trotter, it was personal. Trotter's father was a federal employee. He's the first African-American postmaster, which is a major source of not only Trotter's status in the community, but also his source of pride of envisioning an America that did treat people as equals, regardless of race or color. He does take it personally. There was a huge backlash, and Monroe Trotter and W.E.B. Du Bois were actually accused of being race traitors for having supported Wilson and then finding out what Wilson actually did once he got into office. I think the more American history you read and learn and study, the more disappointing it is that we've not accomplished more. You know, we had an opportunity during Reconstruction to make good on the promises of the Declaration and of the Constitution. We had another opportunity during this era where activists really put on the pressure and attempted to resist the negative impacts of Jim Crow. There are just so many instances in our history where we've had opportunities to be great and haven't taken them. Birth of a Nation was a 1915 film directed by the pioneer D.W. Griffith. And Birth of a Nation is arguably the most racist film ever produced in the United States of America. Not only did Birth of a Nation idealize the antebellum South, but it condemned freed Black men and women, especially the freed Black men. Birth of a Nation reinforced the horrible stereotypes that so many white people embraced after the war. Wilson screamed the film at the White House, and he described the film as like writing history with lightning. He really thought it was a great film, which made it okay for the rest of America to think that this racist film was all right and an accurate depiction of history and not of a fantasy. It was seen by 50 million people across the United States during its initial run. And that's when the population of the United States was 106 million. So imagine, half of the United States was exposed to its hatreds, its lies. And what, what's doubly disturbing about the film is D.W. Griffith, who directed Birth of a Nation, is a pioneering filmmaker. His techniques, they're still used in films today, but he made a film that created stereotypes of black people that persist to the present day. In the early 1910s, leading into the 1920s, there is this rise of new racial stereotypes that portray African Americans as overly aggressive, as uneducated, as unreligious, all of the things that we see portrayed in the film Birth of a Nation. Once you start to have a scenario where viewers of the film have their own prejudices confirmed by what they see on screen, it becomes much more dangerous. And so Trotter is aware of that confirmation bias that develops from watching a racist film like Birth of a Nation. Naya, I think you're absolutely right because Monroe Trotter and others see Birth of a Nation as a pure propaganda film whose purpose is to create two stereotypes, the stereotype that portrays African-Americans in a terrible light and then portrays 
the KKK is guarding the sanctity of white power and white supremacy. Trotter condemned the birth of a nation, these are his words, a rebel play and an incentive to bring on great racial hatred. And in fact, after this film was released, and to use modern language, normalized by Woodrow Wilson, there was a resurgence of the KKK. The KKK even incorporated some practices of the characters in the film in what they did in their organization. For example, the burning of crosses. That didn't originate with the KKK. That originated in the film Birth of a Nation. Uh, the white robes and the white hoods that originated in Birth of a Nation, not with the KKK. But they adopted these practices and made them their own. And after that film, the Ku Klux Klan, which had gone underground, reemerged as a social and political force. So Birth of a Nation had power. If you look at the ways that Trotter responds to the film, it's clear that he decides that that will be the next opportunity to confront Wilson on the issue of race. Trotter's first uh, large protest against the film is in Boston. His readership of The Guardian, he encourages to go out into a large park and to gather and to share their complaints about the film, but to do it in a very public way. They are claiming their blackness. They are gathering together in ways that are normally prohibited. And they are there to confront white leadership who is supporting this film. Later, he organized a group to go to the Tremont Theater to buy out all the tickets. Now, the Tremont was a 100% segregated theater. So blacks weren't allowed to buy tickets. And a Boston cop recognized Monroe Trotter as the group's leader, sucker punched him in the lobby of the theater, and then promptly arrested him and 10 other protesters for creating a disturbance. And you know, the NAACP, they're watching Trotter and the NAACP then, then becomes really the nationwide leader of similar protests all over the United States. So many people from poor and working class African-American communities saw his stance against Wilson as something worth celebrating and they wanted to follow him. He becomes an icon in that moment. So I think for Trotter, even though his legacy doesn't seem to endure the same way as Du Bois or Washington, in this moment, in the 19-teens, He's a titan. William Monroe Trotter. Black history like you have never heard before. Unsung Men and Women of Black History was vehemently attempted to be rewritten by the 28th President of the United States of America, the passionate racist President Woodrow Wilson. If you would like to see more videos like this, please contact me at www.hadaryacove.com or Hadar Yaakov YouTube or Hadar Shmaryahu Yaakov Facebook or www.amazon.com backslash Hadar S. Yaakov. And feel free, you can always email me at Hadar S. Yaakov at gmail.com.
When it comes to black history, we are all too familiar with Black Wall Street, Haiti District of Durham, North Carolina, Harlem, New York during the 1920s, Sweet Auburn Historic District of Atlanta, Georgia, and let us not forget the Black Beaches of Virginia. Some of these historic events about black people in the land of our captivity are widely known and others are not so widely known. But there is a black history that reaches further back before anyone alive today. A black history involving kings and queens absolutely suppressed and dethroned by the greedy businessmen of the United States of America and sanctioned by the United States Congress and the highest office in the land, the President of the United States. This is black history, not American history. This is black history like you have never heard before. This is part four. Personally, I think the history of Hawaii and those who ruled the kingdom is one of the most impressive times in modern history. Similarly, it is one of the most devious and power monger acts of the United States. When it comes to Russia invading Ukraine, the government of the United States needs to shut its mouth and repent for its long history of evil acts. The original Hawaiians and the Kingdom of Hawaii had been a deeply held secret of the United States government. Now, in this modern technology age, all secrets are being revealed. A true, live, and real diva, Queen Lily Ukulani, who ruled the Kingdom of Hawaii. She was the first and the only woman to rule as the queen of the Kingdom of Hawaii. This was the first time that America took over a sovereign nation. America's annexation of Hawaii in 1898 extended U.S. territory into the Pacific and highlighted resulted from economic integration and the rise of the United States as a Pacific power. In 1842, Secretary of State Daniel Webster sent a letter to Hawaiian agents in Washington affirming U.S. interests in Hawaii and opposing annexation by any other nation, a key provisioning spot for American whaling ships, fertile ground for American Protestant missionaries, and a new source of sugarcane production. Hawaii's economy became increasingly integrated with the United States. When Queen Liliuokalani moved to establish a stronger monarchy, Americans under the leadership of Samuel Dole deposed her in 1893. 1895, Honolulu, Hawaii. After her overthrow by American businessmen, Queen Liliuokalani was arrested by the provisional U.S.-led government and placed under house arrest. Liliuokalani was marched from her private residence to Iolani Palace, where she was locked in a bedroom suite and kept captive for months. The administration of President Benjamin Harrison encouraged the takeover and dispatched sailors from the USS Boston to the islands to surround the royal palace. The U.S. minister to Hawaii, John L. Stevens, 
worked closely with the new government. Spurred by the nationalism aroused by the Spanish Americans, the United States annexed Hawaii in 1898 at the urging of President William McKinley. Hawaii was made a territory in 1900 and Dole became its first governor. Racial attitudes and party politics in the United States deferred statehood until a bipartisan compromise linked Hawaii's status to Alaska and both became states in 1959. January 17th, 1893, she wrote, I, Lili Uokalani, by the grace of God and under the constitution of the Hawaiian kingdom, queen, do hereby solemnly protest against any and all acts done against myself and the constitutional government of the Hawaiian kingdom by certain persons claiming to have established a provisional government of and for this kingdom. Now, to avoid any collision of armed forces and perhaps the loss of life, I do this under protest and impelled by said force, yield my authority until such time as the government of the United States shall, upon facts being presented to it, undo the action of its representative and reinstate me in the authority which I claim as the constitutional sovereign of the Hawaiian Islands. Liliuokalani soon discovered that plans to overthrow the kingdom had been in motion for some time. Her protest was clear, direct, and timely, but it fell on unreceptive ears. The Queen learned that U.S. President Benjamin Harrison supported acquiring new territories. She discovered that the U.S. Secretary of State, bolstered by reports of the strategic value of Hawaii, encouraged the U.S. invasion. President Cleveland opposed annexing Hawaii to the United States. He urged Congress to restore Queen Liliuokalani to her proper authority. Despite the president's position, the provisional government refused to comply, and Congress refused to act and use force against them. The business interests that invented Hawaii's provisional government, now unrestrained by the U.S. Congress, defied international law. They installed Sanford B. Dole as their president and declared themselves the rulers of Hawaii, which they now call the Republic of Hawaii. A brief pause to bring your attention to the wickedness of Sanford B. Dole. If you have ever purchased these products, like me, you didn't know. But now that you know, I implore you to cease making this company rich. This is the same Dole that founded the Dole Food Company. Look closely. Did you notice? Look again. This is not a coincidence. It is a fact. The Dole Company was founded in Hawaii in 1851 during the deposing of the Black Queen, Lily Ukulani. Congressman Thomas Ball of Texas argued, the annexation of Hawaii by a joint resolution is unconstitutional, a deliberate attempt to do unlawfully that which cannot be lawfully done. Despite this flawed approach, a resolution was passed and signed by Sanford B. Dole. However, 
Dole had no valid authority to hand the Hawaiian Islands over to the United States. But the U.S. proceeded as if the resolution was legal. On July 6, 1898, the United States claimed to have annexed Hawaii and assumed governance over the Hawaiian Islands and its population. With false authority, Dole transferred 1.8 million acres of crown lands and Hawaiian Kingdom government lands to the U.S. Despite In the year 1993, U.S. President William J. Clinton, in a feeble attempt to cover up the wrongs and the crimes of the United States, signed Public Law 103-150, the preamble stating to acknowledge the 100th anniversary of January 17, 1893, overthrow of the Kingdom of Hawaii and to offer an apology to native Hawaiians on behalf of the United States for the overthrow of the Kingdom of Hawaii. This simply means that the United States acknowledges their sinful, evil, wrongful acts, but they don't do anything about it other than to say, we're sorry. This is the kind of things that the Most High has to take vengeance on. But this is black history like you've never heard before. If you would like to see more videos like this, please contact me at www dot hadar s yaakov dot com or hadar yaakov youtube or hadar shmar yahoo yaakov facebook or www dot amazon dot com backslash hadar s yaakov and feel free you can always email me at hadar s yaakov at gmail dot com